All right, thanks for tuning in. Glad you're here. It's another message in our series, Go Time. And today it says, it's time to set captives free. Uh, it's what people need. We all need to get set free from the junk of this world, the enemy's schemes and all the stuff that goes on in our life. So this is a powerful message. So get ready for a powerful message. You have your Bible, look up 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, and also Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, and Mark chapter 9, 14 to 29. Uh, a lot of stories in here about how Elijah bought into the lies of the enemy, how our struggle's not against flesh and blood, Jesus driving out a demon. It's all going to fit together, so check it out. Okay, our Go Time series, now we're really taking off. We're going higher and higher and higher, and today it's this. It's time to set captives free, people who are stuck in their life and their, their junk in this world and everything else, so that they get set free. And I'm going to go through the biblical teaching rather quickly so I can tell you how I saw all of this in our lessons today lived out in Brazil. So you ready? First thing is this, is that people are held captive by Satan and his demons. Paul says it so clearly in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. People are not the enemy. Say it with me. People are not the enemy. But you see, people, they can be demonized where they become captive to demonic lies and manipulation. It happens all the time. And they can even be used by demons to attack other people. Have you ever been attacked by people? They could very well be demonically empowered and it's not them. It's the enemy inside. They don't know how to control or to handle what's going on. It's what we see happening in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah is this great prophet of God. He had just defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And Jezebel queen gets mad. And she comes after Elijah now to kill him just like he killed all the prophets of Baal. And she even speaks a word curse over him. Listen to what she says. She says, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. She's making a curse. She's making a vow. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them, you're going to die. How many have ever heard of a Jezebel spirit? comes from this lady. This is a spirit that's named after her. It's one that seeks to manipulate and destroy God's spiritual leaders so that they become ineffective in their ministry. Elijah had just brought revival to the people of Israel. He revealed who the true God. They said, he's our God now. And Jezebel, the demons couldn't handle it, and the demon in her came out. I'm coming after you, Elijah, and you're going to die just like they did. If this is what Elijah did, he believed her. And so he started running. He came into agreement with the demonic lie. And he opened the door for fear to set in. Doesn't his voice sound familiar? What good is my life? I might as well die. Nothing good is going on. I'm just going to run away from all my problems, all my stuff. I'm going to go hide in a cave. I'm just out of here. That's what happens when people come into agreement with demonic lies. They think life is over. It's no good. They come into agreement with a lie. It's what happened to Elijah. He became captive to a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's why he's running and hiding. The man who just had this great victory at Mount Carmel, now is trying to hide in a cave. Here are some clues when people are being held captive by a spirit and need to be set free. It's when they have uncontrollable anger. They can't help it, just it comes out. It's also when they have a spirit of, of bitterness. They're, they're bitter against everyone who has hurt them in life because they're living with unforgiveness in their heart. There are people who have to control and manipulate every situation to make it fit what they want. Is any of this sounding familiar? 
They live with fear and anxiety and depression. It's a spirit of fear. It's a real thing. And they have uncontrollable behaviors that they keep falling into the same temptation over and over again. They can't help themselves in getting free from a temptation. You see, when the enemy gets to the inside, he's got an unfair advantage. He's on the inside. We get set free, he's on the outside. We can say, oh, I know what that is. I'm not falling for that. I'm not going for that. I can cast down that thought and make it obedient. But once he's on the inside, addictions and certain behaviors, we feel trapped. Can't help ourselves. See, that's why this message is so important because so many people are being held captive and they need to be set free. Now we see in Mark chapter 9 how captives are set free. Again, I'm going to just highlight a few things in the story. First is to see how Jesus is coming from a place of intimacy with his Father. Actually, him, Peter, James, and John, they're coming down from the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus has been with his daddy on the mountain. His father says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well. Please listen to him. He got to spend time. He's in intimacy. Not only that, Elijah and Moses are there speaking to him and encouraging him for his departure and all that is yet to come. So he's coming from a place of strength, from intimacy. This is key. You got to see this. And when he comes down, now he finds an argument taking place among the religious leaders and his disciples And that's not good because arguments never solve anything. How many of you have ever noticed that? Both sides leave angry. No one has ever been argued into the kingdom. It's an invitation. The man who's there tells him what really happened and how he brought his son to the disciples to drive out an evil spirit, and they couldn't do it. And this is Jesus' response. He says, oh, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I put up with you? How long shall I stay with you? Not good when Jesus says that. Amen? I'd hate for him to come here and say that to us. He's basically saying, where's the faith? Where is it? It's missing you got to understand, faith is the currency of heaven. It's what God wants. It opens the door to everything. It's faith. Doubt puts it away. You see, they couldn't drive out the Spirit because they didn't have the faith. They tried to do it in their own power. Have you ever tried to do things in your own power and it just fails miserably? It always will. Because when we walk in the flesh, it's going to bring destruction. But when we walk in the Spirit by faith and invite Jesus in and live His way and doing it His way, He shows up and does amazing things. But His disciples have been separated and they're probably just doing their own thing. And then this thing came where they had to use the power that they had, the mighty power that Paul talked about in Ephesians. They didn't have it. They didn't have faith. They tried to do it on their own. Also notice that it looks like the boy is having an epileptic, epileptic seizure. Now, we had Dr. Bond in the first service. Doesn't that sound like an epileptic seizure? He, he goes to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He, he becomes rigid. All these things. That's a, that's a classic epileptic seizure. But it's not. That's the point I want you to see. Hold on to that thought. Next, Jesus asks a question. I love this. He asks the Father a question. How long has this been going on? See, asking questions and things is often a good way to find out what's really going on and, and what is happening. So the man answers. He's, he's had this from childhood. And then he goes on to say this, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says, what do you mean? If you can, everything is possible for one who believes. Faith is everything. I'm talking about the faith that trusts everything God says is true. 
You see, even the demons believe in God and shudder. They know he's real. It's not about knowing God is real. It's about having this intimate relationship with him, that you know him as he is, and that what he says is always going to happen. And then I can live and walk in his mighty power that he has for me and step out in faith all the time and trust him with where he's leading me and what he has for me to do. Everything is possible. Nothing is impossible with God and everything is possible for the one who believes. This is a key point in what Jesus is trying to make. And then I love this next part. The father becomes humble. He doesn't say, well... You know, your disciples, if only they would have their act together, then I wouldn't have this problem. And you know how people sometimes get with people? Anyway, he says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. He's transparent before God and says, you know, I have a long way to go. I'm not trying to cover up where I really am with you. I believe but my my faith is weak, and I want more. Transparency is key. We can't fake it with God. He doesn't like us when we say, well, I can do it myself. He wants us to be honest and open with where things really are with him. So all these things are in the story. When Jesus sees a crowd, he rebukes the spirit and tells them to come out and never return. He sets the captive free from what he had been going through in his life with the Spirit. And when the disciples asked why they couldn't do it, Jesus answered, this kind can only come out by prayer, and another translation says by prayer and by fasting. you got to understand prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting sounds like this. Sounds like a lot of work. i got to go all day without food. Maybe three days, ten days, you know. That's going to be hard. Prayer is hard, you know. i got to stop. i got to think. i got to take the time. i got to do all these things. That's not prayer, and that's not fasting. Prayer and fasting is all about intimacy. I want to get close to you, Lord. That's why we fast. We fast for a spiritual breakthrough. I want to get close to you and to walk in your power. I want to put this world behind because when I'm sated, I I really think more about myself. But when I'm fasting, that hunger drives me to you, and I want more of you. And prayer is really about getting in your presence, God, and saying, you are are amazing. I just love you so much. You, You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are so amazing. It's intimate conversation and receiving from Him. Prayer and fasting is all about intimacy. That's the only place where there's power. To set captives free. And that's what Jesus is saying. Intimacy is key. I saw everything Jesus talked about in this lesson while in Brazil. And that's what I want to show you. First of all, I saw the importance of intimacy. I saw it in the way that the Brazilians worship with passion and they'll do it for hours. Every service started, we had services in the daytime and the afternoon, but an evening service would start at 7 o'clock and we wouldn't get out of there until after midnight and they were still there. They have a passion to worship. Here's a video that show you how they worship. the woman jumping up and down she's excited about what it is the room is full everybody's standing they're standing for hours they want to praise the Lord express themselves about 14 years old. She wants the front row. She's 
not somewhere looking on her phone. She wants to worship. Passion by young and old alike. Mostly old young people are at the service. guy with the lanyard there, he's like me, he's from America, he doesn't know the Portuguese words. Sunday night, children are up front. It's a Sunday night, 7 o'clock service. They're not saying, oh, we better get our kids to bed. There's something more important that we want them there. Again, services go late at night. These are part of my team. They don't know the words, so they're just kind of standing there. to understand their culture is very demonstrative so it comes easier for them but God's looking for hearts that want him it's a place of intimacy and that's what they want to do they want to get intimate and they know that worship is one of those places where I can get close to God and I want to express my great love for him and who he is in my life and there's nothing sweeter than being in his presence it's heaven on earth it's what heaven's going to be like so I saw the importance of intimacy. Those people were set free to worship and to receive from God by coming into his presence in that way. Secondly, I saw the importance of faith. They came believing that they were going to get a touch from God. They said, I'm, I'm here and I know God wants to touch my life. I'm going to get something because whenever I come into his presence, he shows up and he does things. And also we who came in our group we came with an expectation we we're going to see God move because we had heard stories and testimonies how God is at work in Brazil and these people and this hunger is setting that atmosphere for God is moving. People are getting healed. Crazy miracles. I saw videos where a person who had a glass eye had a real eye grow out behind it and uh, they could see with an eye they didn't have. People getting up out of wheelchairs. We saw one or two of those while we were there. But they come with an expectation that I'm coming to expect, I'm here to receive. God is in this house, and I'm coming with faith, and we came with faith that we're going to see it as well. There's 120 of us there. They came from all parts of the United States. Some, one guy from Britain. I met a, two from South Africa, a couple from Brazil. They all came with a hunger to get into that presence of what God is doing because of revival. How many of you heard that revival is breaking out at the University of Arkansas? University campuses, Ohio State, Michigan. I know Texas A&M down at Corpus Christi. Amazing revivals going on. And when you're in that atmosphere of revival, God's presence is there. And people get healed and made whole. Captives are set free. And they're open to receive what God has for them. That's why I wanted to go. I wanted to go and bring that back here. This expectancy and that intimacy where God shows up in miraculous ways. So here are some of the people. I want to start out with our van driver. His name is Victor. Victor, I, there were three buses and, and then a van, and I got to be in the van with, like, the speakers and all these things. I'm going, how did I get in this place? This is wonderful. You know, I got front row seats for the worship that were reserved. You know, I got the, I got the royal treatment going on this trip. But he was our van driver, and the Lord was kind of, you know, I was just drawn to him. In one of the services, there had a, an altar call for salvation. And uh, all of a sudden, there's our bus driver up there. 
and my heart is drawn to him because he, he's standing there alone and the speaker's going on and on. And I go, someone needs to go up there and give him a hug. And finally, after a while, the speaker invites the, the ministry team, that's us, to come up and minister to them. And so with 120, I was not the first in the line. I was about halfway. And I'm following this crowd, and I'm thinking, someone's going to already have him, and everything's going to, you know, be there. And I get up there, and it was like the waters parted. And there he was, and it's just me and him. And I gave him a hug and released the Father's love. That's what so many people need is the Father's love, that I'm loved by God, and he wants me. I could just see it on him and, and could release that love. So it was a divine appointment. So that was Victor. That was one of the things that happened. Next picture. I'm going to tell you a story quick of the lady before this. I kept saying this, where the issue is not the issue. That God wanted to do more than what people came to receive and expected. The lady before this had stomach surgery. She had pain in her stomach. I was praying with uh, another guy on our team with one interpreter. Didn't have all the interpreters go around. So he's praying for her stomach, and she's feeling heat. But I could look on her face and see that things were not right. There's something wrong. And so I prayed through the interpreter. I released restoration for her, that God would give her back what she had lost through this illness in her life. And I also came against the spirit of rejection and released a spirit of adoption over her. I just felt that was the thing to do. All of a sudden, she felt queasy and like she was going to pass out. And I thought, hmm, the demon does not want to come out. You see, they're fighting. That's what they'll do. You feel, oh, I got to get out of here. I don't want to do this because the demon doesn't want to be addressed and he's being addressed. He's being called out in that spirit of rejection. And the, the interpreter kept talking to her and he, he, he told us that when her, her mother was eight, when she was eight, her mother died and her father never wanted her. So she's about 40 years old and she lived with this rejection this whole time. So we started speaking life and the Father's love over her and identity and the Father's family and started blessing her. And when we were done, she was glowing with joy. You see, this was connected to here. She had a hole in her life, a hurt and a pain that God wanted to heal. It wasn't the stomach so much as it was her life of rejection. Next picture. Okay. Okay. His name is, I want to say, Fabio. So he came up for prayer for his son that he's holding. His son's name is Noah. And Noah, he said, has been having epileptic seizures. I go, wait a second. I'm preaching on that on Sunday. And then they say, and their daughter Zoe over here, they find her at night screaming and she's rigid in her bed and is scared to death that there's something in her, in their, her room. And I'm going, wait a second. These are connected. I bet there's a demon that's harassing them. So I prayed over them for the protection. We told the enemy to leave that house. He's got to go. And, and for the father to release his love over these children and for their guardian angels to protect them. And I released authority over the father that he take charge over his house, that he has authority in his house and power to tell that spirit to leave. And we just bless them in that way. And in the Saturday service, Winita Messer said, why didn't you just tell that demon to get out of that boy? I'm thinking, well, I really didn't think of it. But I felt the demon was connected to the house and what was going on there. But see, that's what God wants to set captives free. That's his heart. That's his part of the gospel of what he came to win for us. Next picture. All right. This lady, I didn't write down her name. This was the last night that we were there. She had a stroke. And I asked her how, how many years ago, four years ago. You can see the one left side of her face kind of droops a little bit. And so I don't know why, but I asked her this question. I said, what do you really want God to do for you? She said, my husband. Me and my husband, it's not good. And my children, they're, they're rebellious. They won't listen to me. And I go, wait a second. Paralyzed, paralyzed. 
You're paralyzed physically, but the real issue is you're paralyzed in your life with your relationship with your father and with your children. And I said, hey, we're going to do the whole thing. And so we prayed life and vitality, healing for her body and healing in her relationships. And that it would start with her, that her healing would bring healing to her husband, with her husband and with her children. That they would see her walk in her healing and that they would, she would be walking with a healed heart. No longer paralyzed by fear and hurt and pain, but she's walking the fullness of life that he has. That her husband and her children would be drawn to her and to her faith. That's what scripture says. With a a spouse, a, a wife that has an unbelieving husband, that her character, her life will draw the husband to him. So that was, the issue is not the issue. And that she was transparent and open when I asked the question to tell what's really going on. God wanted a greater miracle to set a captive free. Next picture. This is Anna and Anna. The mother's name is Anna, and her daughter's name is Anna. Whoever thought of naming your daughter after yourself? But that's a great thing. Anna, she had, um, I want to make sure. Yeah, she had asthma, and she had a foot that was, would turn in. It wasn't, wasn't walking right. As I'm thinking, and I've already had this, the issue's not the issue, there's not the issue. And what is asthma? It takes our breath away. What is the breath? It's the Spirit of God. For her to walk and, and carry the Spirit of God, she can't feel the Spirit. And in ministry, it's to go where God is leading. And, and the enemy's trying to hinder her from receiving breath, the breath of God, and walking with Him. So I prayed for the physical healing, but I went into the spiritual healing that she would receive the breath of life of the Spirit of God at work in her life and that her foot, and she'd be able to go with Jesus where, she'd lead, where she was leading him. Her whole transformation. Her foot got better. I don't remember if it got well totally. And then her friend is there. Whenever I saw young people, I released destiny. I spoke life over her. And so... She brought her friend, and she was right there to receive as well. Next picture. Next picture. Okay. This is from the first night. The girl on the right, her name is Isabel. Isabella. I got all done. I'm praying upstairs for people, all kinds of stories I'll tell you next week. Came downstairs, a man with a bad knee, prayed for him, that got well. Came up front, and there's this young lady, and she comes up to me, and she says, would you pray for me? I want to know the Lord's will for my life. I'm going, awesome. There's young people who want to know, their passion is for them to know the Lord's will for, her, for their life. I said, all right, Lord Jesus, give her eyes to see and ears to hear. What you're saying, how you're leading, that she can walk in the good works that you have already prepared in advance for her to walk in. Open the right doors. Close the doors that need to be closed. Do what you do to lead her in the way everlasting, all that you have for her. So I'm speaking life and destiny over her. When I get all done, her friend there, the next one is Stephanie. And she says, I want some of that too. <laughs> and I prayed for her for the same kind of thing. For the plans that God had. The, this is like 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, and they're still there. They're hungry for their God-given destiny. Because over there in Brazil, there's a, a heaviness of control by government and different things. They don't know what's going to happen, kind of like America. And so by speaking destiny, they, they were set free to walk in it and to, to receive it and to be encouraged in this journey that God's going to have for them, that he really does want them, and he is at work in the life and has that chosen destiny for them. The next night, it's 11.30 at night, we're getting ready to leave, and Isabella comes running up to see me. It's at a whole different church, a different part of the city. Another night, third night, I walk in the building at 7 o'clock or before 7 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock. Those two are still there. They're at another church. They're hungry. 
And they want even more. Even after they get some and they're getting filled up, they're hungry for more. Their whole life is wanting. You see, when revival is taking place, people live with a hunger and a thirst for the more and the more of God. And they're not satisfied. They keep wanting more and more. And they're open about it. And they will worship. And they look for intimacy. So is there any more? Oh, yeah. i got to tell you this last. Well, this is Daniel. Daniel was just standing there, and I came up to him. And I think I asked him what he wanted me to pray for, but I just grabbed him and hugged him and prayed as I hugged him. See, a lot of men need hugs because they didn't get them from their dads. There's a fatherlessness all over the place, and that's what I, I released the father's love through the hugs and and. And his name is Daniel. And I said, I kept telling him, you're bold as a lion. You're bold as a lion. You're bold as a lion. God wants to use you to release the Father's love to a lot of people who are hurting. And that's what, because that's what I was releasing to him. If anybody knows Todd White, he looks like Todd White, doesn't he? (laughs) The Brazilian Todd White. Just powerful. Look at the smiles. Next picture. Okay. On the right is Arthur. He was my interpreter. And when all the interpreters, I would always pray for them before the, when we were done. Because they run around helping people, but they didn't get a word. They didn't get an encouragement. They saw it, and they were encouraged by that, but I wanted to speak into their lives. And so I spoke to all of them, except for this one. Before I could say it, he asked me, would you pray for me? So I said, well, tell me about your life. He's a pastor. Not of that church. He just came to volunteer to interpret. And he's going through a hard time in his life with his, uh, the superiors and different things. And so I said, man, you're like me. I'm a, I'm a different kind of pastor than those on this trip. And that of all the interpreters who are kids and different things, God used, God set me up with him so I could bless him as a pastor too. That's not in his home church and different things and so I pray for him and then up walks his wife here's the thing his wife the Lord was highlighting her to me the whole service because she looks so Brazilian Brazilian is a a mixture of culture she has that dark skin that beautiful face and and God's just highlighting her and so when I'm done praying and I and she comes up I go wow God this was the setup that you were leading to set them free in your showing. And you set, you're setting me free to be bold and courageous and reaching out and praying for people. See, that's what happens when we seek intimacy. When we want to do what the Lord has for us to do, when we get into that place where we're open and honest and transparent, and it's okay to miss it. It's okay to say, oop, I should have drove out, cast out that demon. It's okay. You know, Lord, I have faith. Help my, in my unbelief. And God is pleased to show up in those places because that faith is so strong and so real in that thing. And so the take home is when captives are fret, set free, they can worship Jesus with passion and joy. You know, that's, that's what you see when the, when the man who was lame was healed. He went running and leaping and praising God in the temple. He wanted to get into where God was and give him all the praise. When someone is set free, they're so thankful and it because it releases so much more of life in them. Secondly, when captors are set free, they can experience healing in body and in soul. Saw that time and time again that the real issue was not the issue, it was the p- issue behind the physical ailment. And that hunger is there for his blessing that was won at the cross, which is physical healing, but setting captives free and binding up the brokenhearted. The whole trip, it was always, John, bless him here, but that's going to lead to the real issue. Oh, I didn't, I don't know if I told you about the man, the first man. He had a hernia in his belly button. That doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? Yeah, that, You can live with a herniated belly belly button. But I said, all right, let's pray for that. And while I'm praying for that, I see the word family in my mind. So I just, 
Quick, ask him about his family. And the man says, I have this disease that has made me sterile. And we really want to have children. Next thing I know, his wife walks up. And she's right there. Again, the Lord had highlighted him to me early in the service. I turned around, there he was. And so I said, let's grab hands. So as a family, me, the interpreter, and the husband and wife, we prayed. We prayed, Lord, release your promise from Genesis chapter 2. To, one, to be fruitful and to multiply, Genesis chapter 2. This is your promise. This is what you made for. And do it, Lord. And when we were done, he was so full of joy, him and his wife. First time I think they've ever been encouraged that God sees them and hears them because, again, they didn't come asking for that prayer, but God saw them, and he had me ask about it so that God could bring the healing where they're really hurting. So healing of body and soul. Finally, when captors are set free, they can live their destiny with boldness and courage, like Daniel, like Isabella and Stephanie. That God has a plan, and there's nothing. When, when we get set free, we can run with the Lord. We can breathe in His Spirit. We can walk with power. Our hearts are mended and made whole. And that's when everything good happens. It's what Jesus paid for, and He wants all to receive. So I went to Africa. I mean Africa. I went to Brazil because I, I heard about what was going on, and I wanted to get into that presence and see what God is doing. I also wanted to be in that presence and pray for people and watch them get healed because I want it to happen here more and more. That we develop a place where it's intimacy, where there's expectation, and where we pray for each other and people really get healed, body, soul, and spirit. Amen? Amen. It's time. Amen. Go time. Time to set the captives free. Amen. 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 Standing all over the building. I don't know about you guys, but living free is the best place to be. You know, there's, when we talk about strongholds and we talk about being in bondage, Christ came that we may be set free right here, right now, man. And messages like this, time for the captives to be set free. Let us not just be hearers of the word, but let us be doers of the word. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we just thank you for the word that came forth on today, Father. Father, help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only, Father. Help us to be that vessel, Father, to carry your message out to this dying world, Father, that we may be able to stand. Stand, Father, when things are tough, when things are rough, Father, that we will stand on your word and your word alone, Father, when it comes to setting captives free, Father, that we may carry your message on our jobs, in our homes, places that we go, that people may see the goodness of you, Lord, in the land of the living. So, Father, we pray right now for First Lutheran Church and every church that's preaching Jesus Christ, Father. For us, as they lift you up, Father, you said in your word that if you be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto you. So, Father, we pray for every church that's preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, that they continue to lift you up, that the world may know that you are our Savior. Now, Father, we just pray for those that are sick, those that are hurting, that need your healing touch. Father, touch their bodies right where they're at. Heal their bodies right where they're at. And we will be forever to give you all the praise and all the glory. Now, Father, we close out with the prayer that you taught us to pray. And that prayer is, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray that today's message bless you in a rich way and that you want to get set free and that you know people need to get set free and will know how to do it so that they can worship Jesus with passion, live healed and whole and really live to want to serve him and follow him with all their heart. If we can be a blessing to you, give us a call. Our number is 501-525-0322 or follow us live on Facebook. We're on Sunday morning at 830 and 11 at uh, First Lutheran Church Hot Springs AR. That's our Facebook page. So we're here for you. Anything we can do, we want to see you blessed and empowered to go in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time.